Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm seeing the participants start to, to build up. Let me make sure here. Okay, sorry about that. Trying to organize here to get, here we go, more promote. Drew, you've been promoted. So now you can be, there we go. Hi, Drew. Hi, Vivian, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, doing well, thanks. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. All right, so um, let's see. Seems like folks are logging in, which is great. Thank you everyone for joining us. So I'm going to hand it over to Drew to offer an introduction um, and then we can get started. Great, thanks Andy. So uh, uh, I, I just wanna start by introducing Vivian. So. Uh, Dr. Vivian Wong is an associate professor in research statistics and evaluation in the School of Education and Human Development at University of Virginia. Uh, her research focuses on evaluating interventions in early childhood and K-12 systems. As a methodologist, her expertise is in improving the design, implementation, and analysis of randomized experiments, regression discontinuity, interrupted time series, and matching designs in field settings. Um, I think of Vivian's work as outstanding in a few respects. So the first is her meticulousness. So if you're doing an experiment or quasi-experiment and you wanna make sure you've thought through all your assumptions and clearly reported the results to the reader, just look at any paper of any evaluation that she's done and use that as a template. Um, so, and I just wanna say an another thing that I particularly associate with Vivian uh, is that in addition to being able to enumerate and test the assumptions required for our study results to mean what we think that they mean, uh, she's pushed the field to go beyond that and to ask, okay, well, in the real world, when are these assumptions met? Uh, you know, how, how often can we get this information? Uh, anyway, for these reasons, Vivian has contributed uh, directly and indirectly to the usefulness of field experiments in education research over the last decade or so. Uh, so uh, without further ado, welcome Vivian. Uh, well, thank you so much, Drew, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and to be chatting with all of you guys. Um, uh, I had not quite imagined how sunny and warm the weather would be in Irvine. Um, so it's very lovely <laughs> to pretend to be here with you guys. Um, so today, what I want to do a little bit is I want to talk about uh, some of the work that our, uh, our laboratory has been doing related to replication. Um, Peter Steiner and I got a grant from IES to, to really work on sort of the methodology of replication. Um, and um, as part of that work, we also work with partners in conducting and running uh, replication studies. So I wanna sort of talk to you a little bit about what that project of research looks like, um, the perspective on replication that we have, which is I think a little bit different from um, sort of traditional approaches to replication maybe that you've read about. Um, and hopefully what I'd like to convince you by the end of this talk today uh, is that you can also do uh, replication studies that actually uh, lots of uh, research designs for replication already exist and already are being conducted in field settings, but maybe are not recognized as replication studies. So I'm gonna present uh, some of our work today and would love to get feedback from you. Um, you should feel free. I'm not very good at sort of monitoring all the different windows that show up on Zoom. So if you have a quick clarifying question, feel free to either interrupt or, or you know, or, or sort of verbally sort of pause me and I, I will be happy to, to answer any questions. Um, I will say that um, one of the things that I'm going to emphasize is that doing replication work is really a collaborative team effort. 
Um, and so in addition to me and Peter working on this, we have a whole lab of graduate students, including Kylie Anglin, Anandita Krishnatari, including staff, uh, uh, Christina and Alexis uh, Taylor, uh, and Brian Wright, who is our school data science uh, collaborator. So this is joint work from, from all of us. Okay, so let me go ahead and whoops, get started. So um, I really enjoy talking about replication in part because this is one methodological area that I don't need to sort of build up in terms of introduction uh, in that many people I talk to, even for example, my own mom, when I talk to her about my research, has somewhere have sort of seen either in the newspaper or in the or in the popular press, or you know, maybe even in some scientific articles, that there's concern about the fact that uh, results uh, that uh, that are sort of produced in the social sciences, but also in the health sciences, may not be as durable or as replicable um, as we may hope that they are. Um, and I think uh, this is a methodological topic that has reached sort of. Uh, sort of the public consciousness in part because uh, sort of the public depends on the fact that the research results that we produce are somewhat replicable across sort of settings that we might be interested in. And part of that concern was raised from studies such as uh, the one that was put out by my colleagues at the Open Science Collaboration and that you probably have also heard about. This is a well-known study that came out in 2015 led by Brian Nosek and his colleagues uh, in which he conducted uh, replications of 100 RCTs and correlational studies in the top three psychology journals. And basically what they found was that only 36% of the uh, original study results could be replicated in terms of statistical significance. And their conclusion from this paper was that the replicability of results in psychology was surprisingly low. Now I should mention here is that even the interpretation of these findings was somewhat up to debate and that there was not complete consensus on, on sort of the interpretation of these results. And in fact, Gilbert et al. argued that the OSC's conclusions were overly pessimistic and that they enumerated a number of reasons why results might not replicate um, in science. For example, uh, there could be statistical error, assumes that sampling error is, is the only reason why results do not replicate. Um, the original studies um, may have low statistical power. Um, and um, work by uh, Jacob Schauer and Larry Hedges did show in fact that these studies were underpowered uh, for, uh, for replications. And there may be issues related to bias. And they point out that only 69% of the protocols for the replicated studies uh, um, from the OSC were actually endorsed by the original authors. So one response um, to sort of this public debate about uh, the replicability of studies has, has been from funding agencies. And uh, a number of funding agencies, including NIH, uh, IES, um, as well as NSF, has sort of pledged to fund uh, and publish more replication efforts themselves. So for example, some of you might remember um, a message from um, uh, the, our IES director, Mark Schneider, who committed to uh, uh, funding and supporting and promoting more systematic approaches to, to replication. Um, and then the last couple of years uh, in, uh, um, in the IES RFAs, you may have noticed that there have been specific calls for, uh, uh, for funding systematic replication studies. NIH supports the training of researchers and graduate students to promote replication of results um, and there have been suggestions from others, from scholars, that suggest that results should be replicated before these, uh, before these, uh, the results are actually entered into publication or even into a decision-making entry or dis decision-making registry, such as the What Works Clearinghouse. So there has been sort of an orientation around the field in the social sciences, but as well as in the health sciences, in order to think about addressing um, uh, this. Uh, you know, what we think of or what we're calling the replication crisis. There's just one problem with this, which is that replication as a method in itself has not been well established uh, in the literature. And what I mean by that is that there isn't really quite consensus on what replication is, what constitutes as a replication study, what constitutes as a high quality replication study, and how, what are appropriate methods for analyzing uh, or for designing, analyzing, and interpreting a replication study. 
So the work that uh, Peter Steiner and I have been doing over the last couple of years has been in efforts to really try to address some of the methodological questions that are related uh, to replication. Uh, and we really think about this as sort of developing the building blocks for how we understand replication science. Um, and so basically the replication science is based on a couple of things. So first, uh, what I'm gonna do today is I wanna introduce um, what we're gonna call the causal replication framework, okay? And the causal replication framework is derived using potential outcome uh, notation from how we think about research designs more generally. Um, and one of the nice things about the causal replication framework is that it defines what the assumptions that are required for replicating causal effect of a well-defined treatment. And what we'll see from the causal replication framework is that the purpose of replication is to evaluate whether a well-defined treatment effect actually replicates and that replication failure occurs when one or more assumption is violated, okay? So one of the main sort of departures in terms of how we think about replication as opposed to traditional approaches to replication is that as we'll see, we don't necessarily view replication uh, failure as inherently a problem for science, okay? But it's not a problem for science as long as we have systematic ways for understanding why that replication failure occurred. And in fact, another way that we might think about replication failure is we might think about it as understanding sources of effect variation or effect heterogeneity, which is essential for being able to understand how to generalize results more uh, generally for uh, uh, target populations and settings of, uh, of, of interest. So our ultimate goal here uh, is to present replication from what we're gonna call a design-based approach and to understand why replication failure occurs. Um, and in order to be able to do this, we're gonna sort of talk about some different research designs that can be used to address and uh, test replication assumptions systematically. Um, and then I'll sort of suggest some diagnostic measures that can be used for assessing replication assumptions in field settings. Uh, in general, this is how we think about uh, sort of how we're approaching our work. Uh, sort of the first sort of core area of our work, which I'll talk a little bit about today is what the re causal replication framework is. It's just basically five assumptions that are required for the direct replication of results. Um, and then basically from the causal replication framework, what you'll see is that you can, it's pretty straightforward and easy to derive some research designs for examining effect heterogeneity or variation. And then in the next step, you can integrate multiple research designs in order to be able to identify multiple sources of effect heterogeneity. And then our fourth area of work is thinking about uh, developing metrics or uh, statistical approaches for assessing replication success. Okay. What I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna focus mostly on those first three. Um, and then towards the end of the year, we're gonna have a paper coming out on, on sort of metrics for assessing replication success. Um, and what you'll see is that um, in order to be able to do this work, it's, it's sort of a large scale enterprise in, in science um, and it, it requires sort of an interdisciplinary approach. So my, my colleague Peter and I have been folks who have sort of spent a lot of our time thinking about statistics and research designs for, uh, for analyzing uh, systematic replication studies. But lately we've also uh, begun uh, collaborating with uh, our colleagues in the School of Data Science because it turns out that the key, one of the key challenges for the implementing replication um, is related to sort of scaling up of uh, collecting data from multiple sites and sources. Um, and we, you, we really need data science approaches for being able to handle sort of the feasibility of those methods. Um, and then we also have a number of content area, uh, content area partners, including in reading, special education, early childhood education, and teacher preparation, in which we are conducting um, these replication studies. Um, so for example, these are some examples of uh, uh, replication, systematic replication studies that are either have been in the field or going in the field. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more today about this example for TeachSim for improving the preparation of new teachers. One sort of, um, one sort of characteristic that differentiates our work from 
uh, work that may have been, you know, for example, conducted in Center for Open Science is that a lot of our replications take place in field settings. So in schools and teacher preparation programs, right? Um, whereas the Center for Open Science, those replication efforts have mostly been sort of laboratory-based uh, projects. And so the, the implementation questions have become sort of a much bigger concern, I think, uh, in our efforts to conduct uh, replication studies. Okay, so let me begin a little bit by talking about how we think about and how we define uh, replication. So, um, Sort of the first question, which honestly it's, has not really fully arrived at consensus is, is this, this question of what is replication itself? And sort of the most common uh, sort of uh, quote, I guess I see sort of cited is, is this one from Schmidt. Um, and Schmidt writes that replication is a methodological tool that is based on the repetition of procedure that is involved in establishing a fact, truth, or piece of knowledge, okay? So I want you to take just a second, look at the definition and think to yourself, um, what do you think of this definition? Is this a definition that you might agree with, that you might disagree with, okay? I think this definition um, matches, I think, uh, or at least covers, I think, what a lot of people think about uh, in terms of replication. And in particular, uh, folks, I think, often emphasize a particular part of this definition, which is that replication is about something related to the repetition of procedure, right? So uh, I think many current approaches to replication emphasize repeating an experimental procedure. And in fact, Schmidt defines direct replication or exact or close replication as being about uh, repeating experimental procedures. A lot of really smart folks also sort of define replication in similar ways. So my, again, my colleagues, Brian Nosek and Tim Arrington uh, define replication as being independently repeating the methodology of a previous study or obtaining the same result. OSC talks about as recreating conditions. Brandt talks about methods and procedures as close as possible to the original study. So if you if the definition of replication is based on uh, how closely uh, sort of the, the replicate study is able to mirror or replicate sort of the original study, then it stands to reason that the way that we judge the quality of replication is how closely the replicate study is able to actually repeat the methods and procedures from the original study, right? And if, you, if you've actually tried to conduct a replication study uh, in your own work, um, it, you know, a couple of challenges sort of very quickly come to mind, right? The first and the most common sort of challenge that people run into is that the original study may fail to report all relevant and necessary methods, making direct replication difficult, if not, if not even uh, possible at all, right? So Hansen writes an article suggesting how is, is direct replication as an enterprise even possible? How could you possibly repeat every single method and procedure in exactly the same way? The second challenge that people often encounter uh, with this type of approach to replication is that it privileges methods and procedures in the original study, right? Um, and if you are people who work in field settings such as we do in education, right? Think about the last time that you conducted a study in which everything went exactly perfectly, that you know, that you were able to, that you implemented all the methods and procedures at intervention, everything went exactly according to plan. Um, and so this often raises a dilemma when folks are conducting the, uh, the, re the replicate study that uh, if there were errors or if maybe there were deviations from the study protocol, um, the, the replicators often left wondering, well, what should we be doing here? Should we be replicating the original flawed procedures or should we be choosing a procedure that we know is probably more appropriate, right? And then finally, the third sort of question is sort of like the philosophical issue that the goal here doesn't seem, or like at least the, the, how we think about measuring quality replication doesn't seem to really get at what we're interested in, right? The thing that we're interested in is understanding whether the effect itself replicates. So to judge it by the methods and procedures, there's, a, there's sort of a lack of alignment in terms of how we're thinking about replication. So what I'd like to suggest is that we go back to Schmidt's definition, because I do think it's actually a pretty good piece of definition, but instead of emphasizing the part of the definition that's about repetition of procedure, um, I'd like to emphasize this part about focusing on establishing a fact, truth, or piece of knowledge as being the main and the core purpose of replication, okay? 
And it turns out that from our sort of methodological work over the last 30 years in terms of thinking about program evaluation and how we understand research designs and program evaluation, we have a way that we are able to formalize and to be able to characterize and uh, describe what we mean by fact, truth, or piece of knowledge. And the way that we do this mathematically is that uh, we say that the goal is to replicate a causal effect of a well-defined treatment effect. Or another way to, way to think about this mathematically is that we're, the goal here is to replicate the same causal estimate. And here the causal estimate is defined as a causal effect of a well-defined treatment control contrast for some clearly defined target population and setting, okay? And so what this implies is that while repeating methods and procedures will often be extremely useful in replication studies and something that we should try to do, um, it is not always necessarily required that we repeat exactly the same replication um, um, or, or that we repeat exactly the same methods and procedures. Instead, what I'm gonna suggest is that our goal should be focused on addressing what the assumptions are that allow us to produce that for two or more studies to be able to identify and estimate the same causal estimate, okay? So what are those assumptions? Well, um, let me go ahead and, and, get, and, and get to that part. So the assumptions are, there's, we've, we've basically written out sort of the assumptions into, there, there are five assumptions. Um, and um, these are sort of assumptions that if you sort of derived basically using potential outcomes notation, um, how two or more studies would be able to produce the same effect. Th these are the assumptions that sort of guide what conditions would be needed for uh, those effects uh, to be able to replicate. Um, and these five assumptions can basically be thought of as sort of two types of assumptions, right? The first two assumptions that I'm gonna call R1 and R2 are what Peter and I call replication assumptions. Um, and, this, and, the, and the other three assumptions are uh, indicated by S1, S2, and S3 are what Peter and I call individual study assumptions, okay? So individual study assumptions are what we call um, identification assumptions. So does within each study, does the research design identify the, uh, the effect in an unbiased way, okay? S2 is about estimation, are the treatment effects estimated in an unbiased way within each study? And then the third assumption, S3, is what we call correct reporting. So are the estimates, estimators, and estimates themselves correctly reported within each study? Okay, so S1, S2, and S3, they're individual study assumptions because these are the assumptions that are required of any kind of causal um, study that for any individual study to yield an unbiased effect, these three assumptions have to be met. Okay, R1 and R2 are what we call uh, replication assumptions. And so these assumptions require, uh, in, in order for two or more studies to be able to produce the same causal estimate across these different uh, uh, studies, the R1 and R2 assumptions have to be met. So R1 basically says, are the treatment, is there treatment and outcome stability? Are the treatment conditions the same across all of the studies? Are the outcomes measured in the same way? Do they, do they represent the same constructs? Do they have the same measurement properties? Okay, and then R2, the second replication assumption is related to the equivalence of the causal estimate. So do all of the studies have the same uh, participants with the same unit characteristics, setting characteristics, context characteristics on all factors um, that might moderate uh, the, or moderate or the, the treatment effect here, okay? If you think, if you sort of sit down and you think about, well, what would be the assumptions required for uh, effects for two studies to replicate? Most of these assumptions uh, make sense. Um, they're, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're fairly intuitive but it does help to have them sort of laid out uh, in one framework. One thing that is useful, or at least that Peter and I find useful about having this framework, right, is that um, uh, sort of having a framework like this uh, sort of laid out like this makes it clear that replication failure occurs when one or more of these assumptions are violated, okay? Um, and under the causal replication framework, 
it's possible to sort of understand uh, why replication failure might occur. And the way that you might sort of think about why replication uh, failure might occur, right, or be able to understand why it occurs, is that if you were able to address all four of the other assumptions, but systematically vary conditions in your study to be able to test one of your assumptions, if you found that results from these two studies weren't able to replicate with each other, you would be able to conclude fairly confidently why those two study results uh, would not replicate. Okay. So our argument here is that under the causal replication framework, replication failure is not inherently a problem as long as the researcher understands why. Okay. Um, and, um, and the way that we're going to use in order to be able to understand this is by systematically testing each of the one or two of the assumptions in controlled ways while trying to address all other assumptions. Okay. Now, you might say, this seems like a very tough hurdle, right? Like, uh, how is it possible that you would be able to address all or even four out of the five of these assumptions? And what I'd like to suggest to you is that we actually have studies like this that we implement um, on a semi-regular basis. Um, and that these studies are, in fact, replication studies, if you think about it in terms of uh, the causal replication framework. So for example, I'm going to take um, assumption three. So for example, let's say you are interested in conducting a replication study in which you are interested in evaluating uh, whether correct reporting occurred across the studies. Well, another way to think about this is that this is an example of what we might refer to as a reproducibility or a reanalysis design, right? And in fact, this type of study has been conducted. For example, there's paper by Chang and Lee in which they took original data and syntax files um, and they tried to reproduce basically results using the original data and syntax files and look to see whether the results sort of corresponded. And if they didn't, then that suggests uh, that there was some kind of reporting error that happened, right? And if you think about comparing uh, how that type of research design compares to our causal replication framework, you can see that because the replicators were using the ori same original data, the same original syntax files, that almost all of the other as replication assumptions were met here. The only thing that differed across the two was basically who was reporting uh, the results from um, the original study as, what for, as from the, the replicate study, okay? And another example, uh, the example that basically inspired a lot of our work ar around this is in the case of uh, design replication or within study uh, comparisons. So in within study comparison designs, uh, basically you take an RCT, okay? And then, um, you, and then you, you, you find an observational arm that shares the same target population, uh, has the same measures as the RCT. And the idea is to compare the results that you've obtained from the uh, observational study to the RCT benchmark in order to be able to determine the performance of the observational study method in field settings. And that example, that's basically a case of two replicate studies in which the research designs across the two studies were systematically varied, but that the target population, the treatment, the outcome, um, and all other conditions were, were met. So this is an example of a sort of a traditional design of a within study comparison where you have an overall population and some group gets assigned to the RCT and then you construct an observational study. And the goal here is to co uh, compare the treatment effects from the RCT to the non-experimental comparison, okay? And again, in a high quality version implementation of this within study comparison or this design replication study, the only sort of uh, uh, assumption that the researcher is varying is the research design that they're using such that, uh, that it becomes clear why treat, if uh, treatment effects didn't replicate, why, uh, why uh, these, uh, the cause of what that effect uh, variation was, okay? So there's a whole other set of research designs that, that people might use in which they might introduce systematic variations in treatments uh, and in outcome stability, as well as in units um, and in settings. So for example, um, you might think about uh, multi-arm treatments. 
okay, where individuals are assigned into not one a treatment or a control condition, but to multiple treatment arms, that as a type of replication study or uh, research studies in which that examine uh, replication of proximal and distal measures, um, as well as multi-site designs and robustness checks and switching replication designs. Um, these are research designs that I will talk about a little bit later in our example. But these are examples of research designs that can be used to test sort of specific assumptions uh, under this framework. One thing that's useful about sort of thinking about this framework is that, uh, is that it also provides us a way to formalize what our understanding of two sort of, uh, sort of common definitions that people use in replication. So you probably have heard of people talk about direct replication and conceptual replications. Okay, but there's also often a lot of variation in terms of what people mean by direct and conceptual replication. And here under the framework, it's pretty straightforward to understand, which is that a direct replication is basically any sort of two studies that seek uh, to examine whether effects replicate that have the exact same causal estimate. Okay, so basically you systematically try to vary uh, one of the S1s, S2 through S3 assumptions, okay? And a conceptual replication are basically uh, two or more studies in which um, the causal estimates uh, are, are two, sorry, two more studies with potentially different causal estimates are compared uh, against each other, okay? And what's useful about sort of thinking about direct and conceptual replications in this way is that if, you are able, when in the case where you have a direct replication and results fail to, uh, to replicate, the researcher concludes that individual study, that the reason why uh, uh, replication sort of failure occurred was that individual study results themselves were either biased or incorrectly reported, right? Because there was a violation to either uh, unbiased identification or unbiased estimation assumption or the results were not correctly reported. And then the case where results fail to replicate in a conceptual replication, the researcher concludes that there, the presence of effect variation. So that means that basically because of variation in how either the treatments were implemented or the types of outcome measures were being used or in terms of the target populations that were targeted, that those variations in study characteristics uh, produced moderations in effect. And in these cases, um, we would say that, again, this is not inherently a problem or uh, sort of for science, right? Like we do plenty of studies in which we are interested in knowing, uh, for, for example, the performance of different types of non-experimental methods in field settings. And it's useful sort of scientific knowledge for us to know when either a research design or an estimation approach fails to, to produce sort of uh, unbiased results. And in the case of conceptual replication, we are interested in understanding the source of effect variation because we want to be able to generalize these effects to, to sort of uh, more general uh, target populations of interest. Finally, we would say that uh, sort of the, uh, the sort of the third benefit of a design-based approach to replication is that now it provides assumptions for determining high quality direct and conceptual replication designs, okay? Um, and so we can think about either planning uh, research design uh, features or planning diagnostic measures that allow us to start thinking about what, about measuring the extent to which these assumptions were either met in field settings or whether they, uh, or whether they were systematically varied or varied in ways that we had not anticipated. So let me sort of finish up here by um, giving you an example of a, a sort of replication study that we, or a series of replication studies that we've been conducting um, at UVA over the last several years in order to be able to, to sort of think about the feasibility of conducting uh, multiple conceptual replication studies. Um, so this is uh, an example that takes place in the context of teacher preparation. So um, at UVA, one of the technologies that we've adopted in order to better help uh, sort of provide our teacher candidates with uh, training opportunities is allowing our teacher candidates to be able to, to sort of practice these pedagogical tasks or skills um, in the context of a simulated 
a classroom environment. So these are student avatars that are played by an actor that the teacher candidate is not aware of. And basically what the teacher candidate tries to do is they try to deliver a lesson in the simulated uh, classroom environment in order to be able to, to, to sort of practice different types of skills like either a classroom management skill or providing feedback and, uh, on a text. Um, and so one of the things that we've been exploring is how do we get uh, help teacher candidates improve in this kind of simulated setting. Uh, we've been looking at coaching, basically co uh, what coaching looks like in this, uh, uh, in this setting. Um, and so we've, we've, we sort of constructed a couple of research questions around this. So the first sort of question or the first RCT that we conducted basically looked at whether or not coaching improved teacher candidates pedagogical practice in virtual classroom settings, okay? And then we basically conducted another six RCTs subsequently in which we uh, systematically varied different study factors in order to be able to assess how robust uh, these coaching effects were across uh, systematic sources of effect heterogeneity. Um, so at UVA, we've sort of, we've implemented basically this uh, continued planned um, RCT evaluation that occur every year and every semester. Um, and we also have uh, this longitudinal dating tr uh, data tracking system where we track the students' performance throughout the year. Um, and so basically, um, I'm going to talk about some study results that occurred from 2017 through 2020. Each of these years basically represent a new teacher cohort, candidate cohort who comes in. And we basically conduct two sets of studies um, each year, one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, each of the teacher uh, candidate cohorts includes about 100 candidates uh, within each RCTs. And we should note here that the RCT samples are not independent and in that we have uh, within years, we have uh, candidates across the two studies that are uh, teacher candidates are the same across the two studies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that study design in a few minutes. Okay. So one of the first things that we did when we sort of sat down and planned out our source, our, our sets of systematic replications is we worked with the research team to talk about what are you, what do you think about as being sort of the most sort of uh, as sort of being the, 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 the sources of, um, of effect variation? And basically, as a research team, we sort of brainstormed this, this list of uh, potential sources. The first um, was related to sort of the types of pedagogical tasks that the candidate uh, performs in the simulator. The second is related just to the timing, you know, whether effects replicate over time, okay? Third was related to participant characteristics and the training settings that they come from. And the third was uh, related to mode of delivery. So do they do this in person or do they do this over you know, Zoom? Um, and so in order to be able to address these questions, what we implemented was basically a series of three types of research designs, or it ended up being four replication studies using uh, data from six individual studies. So the first replication uh, research design that we used uh, was we had RCTs with multiple cohorts to evaluate it re replication success over time, whether the same effect was able to replicate it uh, over, over time. Um, the next uh, research design that we implement was called a switching replication study to look at replication success across pedagogical tasks. And the third is what we call a matched conceptual replication to evaluate replication success across participants and settings. Um, and, um, and basically what the RCT with multiple cohorts design involved was that for cohort one, we randomized them into two conditions, self-reflection or coaching. And then for cohort two, that we expected to look fairly similar in unit characteristics, as well as in terms of setting characteristics, we, we redid the same study. And then we compared the treatment effects across the two cohorts. And we also checked on whether or not uh, the, uh, whether assumptions for the other assumptions were met. For the switching replication design, we conducted the switching replication design within each of the cohort years. So in the fall, teacher candidates are uh, randomized to either receive coaching or self-reflection, okay? And then in the spring, basically, teachers who got the coaching condition in the fall were randomized or received self-reflection, and then 
teachers in the control group became part of the treatment group, okay? And basically what we were looking for there was whether or not coaching effects replicated when teacher candidates were engaged in different pedagogical tasks. So in the fall, they were engaged in a task that involved feedback management, but they were coached in using a protocol. And then the spring, the task that they had to that they had to conduct was around setting classroom norms and classroom management, but they were coached according to the same protocol. So their 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 tasks changed there. Um, there's some advantages and disadvantages to the switching replication design. Um, so first, it allows the, some advantages include that it allows the researchers to evaluate whether effects replicate across variations in time and settings allowed all of our units eventually to be able to receive treatment allocation. And it also has quite a bit more statistical power because units are shared across the two uh, study, uh, uh, across the two studies. The limitation is that the treatment has to have a quick and immediate effect and it has, and, 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 and basically our outcomes have to go back to baseline after a few weeks. Um, and then statistically you have to adjust for the dependencies and the standard errors across studies. And then finally, we had some conceptual replications basically where we tried to match all of the conditions, but we varied uh, who the target population was and what their training program was. And then also what um, the mode of delivery, whether the, the program was in, uh, in person or, or in, in, uh, conducted over Zoom. So in all, um, as we sort of planned out our systematic replication studies, we sort of wrote down what all of the assumptions were Okay, and then we thought about what each of the research designs were, were sort of um, designed in order to be able to test in terms of introducing systematic uh, replication. And then what we also thought about was how do we assess whether the other assumptions are met, uh, because we are working in field settings, so we anticipated that there would be deviations uh, from, um, um, from what we had planned in terms of the study design. In terms of our analysis of the replication results, I'm just gonna go through this in a very high level way. Uh, our first sort of task was about sort of assessing the replication design assumptions for each study um, and for uh, the systematic replication studies. Then we estimated individual effects for each study. Um, and then we produced basically a couple of different measures for how we think about replication success, including a meta-analytic effect uh, across all of the studies that's pulled um, and using a uh, Q statistic for evaluating effect heterogeneity. And then we also use correspondence tests to test a series of pairwise comparisons for each of the study designs. Um, I'm just gonna very sort of quickly highlight basically here in terms of how we think about uh, uh, assessing replication assumptions. Um, and so here, what we do is we think about using a whole set of um, balance tables that compare basically how similar and how different studies were on sort of key characteristics um, uh, across all of the, across the different studies here, right? So we have a bunch of unit characteristics, uh, measures for context characteristics and timing. Um, and so we look to basically see across these different studies, whether or not there was variation in unit characteristics where we expected there to be, okay? Um, and um, and so I, I'm running low on time here, so I'm not gonna go through all of these tables, um, but then we also produce a table in which we look at uh, replication factors that we hope would be uh, sort of held constant across all of these studies. Um, and so we, my student Kylie Anglin has been using natural language processing methods to be able to develop this treatment fidelity score across these different studies, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. We also look at psychometric properties to assess outcome stability, as well as uh, methods for assessing whether the research design, estimation strategy, um, and reporting assumptions were met. And then so finally, I can give you sort of some high level results of, uh, of, of from, from the different studies. Overall, this uh, coaching had a fairly large impact on pedagogical practice about 1.1 standard deviations. Um, and that mostly we saw that uh, these effects were robust uh, for, uh, for our teacher candidates, okay? But that for our sample of candidates 
that were undergraduates and who participated in these simulations as an exploration for whether or not they wanted to become teachers, um, we could see that these treatment effects did not replicate for, for, these, uh, for, for, for this uh, subpopulation of, of individuals. Um, but in general, they replicated for our teacher, uh, uh, teacher candidate population across different pedagogical tasks, across different modes of delivery, um, and um, um, and across different times. So um, let me go ahead and just finish up here. Uh, we've got a couple of other sort of replication studies that uh, are planned along the way. So now basically we're gonna replicate this set of uh, replication studies that we've done in the teacher preparation context, but now with multiple uh, universities. Um, so we're collaborating with uh, uh, Rio Grande Valley and Southern Methodist to design sort of a similar kind of uh, a set of replication studies. Um, we are also conducting a series of systematic replication studies to evaluate the impacts of uh, read well in first grade. Um, and again, here we have a multi-site design plan for our first systematic replication. And um, our second set of replication designs will basically depend on what the results are from the first one. If we have replication success in the first one, then we'll, we will, then the second round of replication studies will look to see whether we can replicate these effects when the intervention is delivered by school personnel. If the results, if we're not able to replicate the effects in the first design, then the second replication study will involve basically an enhanced version of the intervention. Um, so what I hope to sort of give you guys a high level overview here uh, is to suggest to you that planning prospective systematic replication studies are feasible and that probably many of you are actually already conducting versions of replication studies now in your own work, but may not fully recognize them as replication studies. Um, and, um, and, you know, that, it, you know, if we think about, if we sort of change our orientation and thinking about, we it, it seems clear that we can conduct uh, replication studies, uh, even in field settings. There's a number of methodological issues that we are continuing to work on, including how do we think about different metrics for evaluating replication success? Statistical power is, is going to be a big issue in terms of how we're thinking about replication, because it's clear that a lot of the replication studies are underpowered. Um, we're also thinking about metrics for how we, how we define what a failed replication is in implementation. And then finally, we're thinking a lot about sort of new methods and research roles that are needed in order to be able to carry out a research um, involving sort of replication as, as, as sort of part of our everyday practice. Okay. So I want to thank everybody uh, for hanging in there and for listening. And I would love to hear any questions um, or follow up that you might have. Awesome, thank you, Vivian, that was wonderful. Um, uh, I'll give folks a, a minute or two to mull over any questions they have and please put them in the Q&A uh, uh, box. Um, I uh, have to run, actually have a, a meeting with uh, some community partners, but Drew has graciously offered to facilitate our Q&A session. So uh, Drew, I think, I, I assume you're familiar how to use that function. Sounds great, yeah, thanks, Andy. Great. So thanks so much again, Vivian. It was, it was a real Thank pleasure. You. And um, yeah, I'm sad. I, I, I'm going to have to miss out on the Q&A, but I'll get caught up. I'll get caught up. Great. Thank Great. you so much. Thanks for inviting mm -hmm. me. Bye. Thanks, oh, everybody. one quick note, uh, Drew. We, we try to, uh, if folks, students could write a student or something next to their questions so we can take student questions first. Um, we're trying to establish that norm in the, in the brown bags. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. So yeah, feel free to uh, put up your hand or drop your questions in the box. And uh, like Andres said, I think the, uh, well, I'll try to take the first question from a student, please. All right, here we go. Let's see. So. We have a, a question from uh, uh, Wesley Jeffrey, uh, who asks, um, how do you adequately account for all differences across settings? 
Uh, yeah, so that is uh, that is that's that's a challenge, right? In terms of how we have been sort of thinking about that um, in the simulation in the simulation settings. You know, we 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 purposely started with the the the, the teach sim um, example as a way to again in part because we could we could control a fair amount in terms of the settings because we're able because they're simulation settings, we have sort of a lot of capability to be able to sort of control um, how they're introduced to the interactors, how, or the student avatars, how the student avatars react to them. So, so we have a fair amount of control on the simulation side. And then basically what we do in terms of the setting side, um, you know, that's a question that we have been sort of we have been debating openly as as sort of as as a methodological team. For now, what we have done is that as we have sort of a series of processes where our methods team and our intervention team, so our substantive experts, we have hold a series of meetings basically where we work through the theory of change model, we work through the logic model, we go through each piece of it. And we talk about as a team, we have a series of brainstorming sessions basically within our team to talk about thinking about participant characteristics, setting characteristics for how the intervention is implemented, setting characteristics related to the research side. Um, and we, we basically go through sort of a brainstorming list where everybody has an opportunity to write down what they believe could be potential moderators. And then we work from that list in order to be able to think about, can we feasibly measure? What can we measure? What can we not measure? What can we measure? We think it's an important goal that, um, that we are able to report the results of these brainstorming sessions so that at the end we report basically, these are, are the moderators that our team hypothesized in advance of the study. These were the factors that we were able to collect data on. And these are frankly the factors that we could not collect data on. And so if there are treatment effect variation that we can't explain from our observed data, this is these were all the things that we were not able to measure. But the goal here is to try to be as transparent as possible about sort of what our thinking and reasoning is and doing it in sort of a structured way. Great, yeah, thanks, that seems quite useful. Uh, so uh, Greg Duncan asks, whether you agree or disagree with the following quote from Lee Robbins, uh, in the long run, the best evidence for the truth of any observation lies in its replicability across studies. The more the populations studied differ, the wider the historical eras they span, the more the details of the methods vary, the more convincing becomes the replication. Um, hello, Greg. It's great to hear from you again. Um, Greg was a faculty member where I was at Northwestern. Um, so yes, I think that that's I think that that's true, right? Like I think that those are sort of the truths that in science that we would all aid to want to be able to uncover. And I think when we think about replication and we think about effects and we see effects that are durable and are able to replicate, that's the, in some ways that feels like the more straightforward case, right? What sort of inspired our work was seeing the many sort of study results um, that, or the many replication results that were being published that sort of found that results did not replicate and people sort of throwing their hands up in the air and saying, well, we don't know why that, you know, that these results don't replicate. Um, and sometimes they're interpreted as being about, about being bad science. And I think that is true in, in, in some cases, but in some cases it's, it could also just be about effect variation or effect heterogeneity. Um, and so we wanted to be able to disentangle uh, in cases where results do not replicate, why do they not replicate? And knowing why they don't replicate is just as important for science. That makes sense. I, I, I've noticed uh it's sometimes hard to communicate with my fellow psychologists who aren't in ed schools of education because the probably effects are maybe a lot more heterogeneous in the field than they are right. in these well-controlled lab studies where you just send someone the computer program to run. Uh, right, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Shunfei Li asks, um, 
how, how do you evaluate if certain topics need replication studies? And thanks you for your amazing talk. Um, so I think, so I have a version of this talk where, um, and in some ways I think actually inspired by a paper that Greg wrote with Mimi and Amy um, that tries to make a pitch that we should be incorporating versions of replication in all of the work that we do uh, regardless of what type of work. So, so for example, I think that um, any study that we conduct should, should sort of run basically sort of robustness checks for different types of model estimation approaches. I didn't come up with that idea. Greg uh, and his co-author sort of pointed that out and sort of inspired that. Um, but you know, checking for different outcomes on different subgroup populations, those are all versions of thinking about replication and robustness. And we can, we can do that as part of our matter of practice and we can also report those results as well. Um, as part of our lab too, we have also made it a practice where before we publish any results, we ask somebody independently in our, who is part of our lab, but independently who hasn't seen the results to try to reproduce those results. And then we try to also, you know, uh, make the um, syntax and code public like on a GitHub so that those are reproducible. Um, so I do think that, it, and then if you are on the development side, if you are thinking about intervent, intervention development, um, which the teach sim context really is, right? Our teach sim context is really about sort of thinking about intervention development. Like you could incorporate thinking about sort of planning a series of systematic replications as you are uh, developing your intervention and you're iterating over time, but sort of trying to keep it track in a systematic way what factors you are varying um, and what you are sort of um, sort of holding sort of similar across conditions over time. Got it, thanks. So maybe we have time for one or two more. Uh, th this question is from Emily Penner uh, who asks, um, uh, it seems your framework seems particularly helpful for researcher led studies and replication efforts. I'd be curious to get your thoughts about how it could work in situations where the intervention is designed by practitioners. Um, mm. This seems like a scenario where it could be more difficult because less data has been collected along the way. Uh, maybe yeah. this is related to your answer to the first question, which was about, uh, oh, about accounting for, presumably measuring and accounting for all the differences across settings. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that that's right. Um, and, I, you know, I don't, I don't know fully know the answer to your question, but one thing that our team has been thinking about a lot has been related to sort of reporting standards and conventions around um, um, what types of information researchers should report as 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 part of their studies, right? Um, and if you are familiar with the work of Larry Hedges and Beth Tipton. Larry thinks about replication too. He thinks about it from a meta-analytic standpoint, right? Um, and, and so our, our argument is basically that if, if studies adopted a causal replication framework in terms of first prospectively designing, but also in terms of collecting data, in terms of reporting data, all of that information is going to be much more useful on the synthesis end when you're meta-analyzing results across these different studies as well, because you'll be able to interpret and understand what are these apples and oranges that you're, you're trying to synthesize together. Um, and I guess my, my thought too is that if researchers um, um, had sort of a more consistent framework in terms of the types of things that they report and put out there, uh, either for reporting purposes, but also and for synthesis, but also for replication, then that sort of makes it a, a lot easier for everybody in the field to either synthesize or interpret or replicate that work. Great. Well, uh, thanks so much, Vivian. This is uh, this was really great. Um, there are more really good questions. I, I think it'd be fun to stick around the rest of the day, but I, I wanna just be sensitive to people's time, particularly because it's a holiday. Um, yeah. So maybe we can, uh, it, it would be fun to, uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to copy these questions or something and uh, we can talk about them more later or something. 
Uh, yeah, and feel free also to email me um, or reach out, and I'm happy for us to, for us to chat anytime. Um, these I do see there are some great questions here, and would love to chat with you guys uh, about this. That would be great. Well, thanks so much, everybody, uh, and thanks so much, Vivian, uh, for your talk. And uh, uh, I hope we can uh, uh, talk more soon. Okay, great. Right. Thanks okay. for inviting me. It was great to to see all of your questions at least. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And uh, Vivian, I uh, I think Daniela sent a link for our- Yes. You have that? Okay, great. All right. I have that, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Right. I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes or in a minute, okay. okay.